I'm sitting right here. Yep. It's my seat. Thank you. And I said, y'all, um, sit here. All right, I want to welcome everyone to the House Civil Justice Full Committee meeting for today. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you go ahead and take the roll. Representatives Beck, Bricken, Bolso, Capley, Eldridge, Gant, Garrett, Grills, Harris, Lambert, Littleton, Parkinson, Powell, Russell, Stevens, Todd, Vice Chairman Jernigan, Chairman Farmer. Mr. President. Chairman, you have a quorum. All right, thank you for that. Uh, members, before we get started, we've got a crowd out here, and I want to welcome everybody for being here today and, and thank everyone for being here. Uh, do we have anybody like to recognize, recognize or any comments from the committee members? Uh, Representative Powell, you recognize? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to uh, recognize all the women in the audience. Today's International Women's Day, and I want to thank all the women in the audience and on uh, the committee and on the staff for uh, uh, contributions that women have made across the world globally. Thank you. Very good. Members, any, anyone else before we, any other questions, comments, recognitions? I do. I have a friend out there. I have Barry Fain here today, standing over there, patiently awaiting today's committee. Appreciate you being here. I don't know if Kevin's here or not. Kevin's post here as well, but Barry, certainly appreciate you being here and do what you do. Uh, got a couple of announcements first. What we're going to do, we're going to roll item, item one. That's what most everybody's here for. Item one, we're going to roll that to the hill without objection by today's calendar. Also, item nine, House Bill 1355, uh, we're going to roll that item uh, two weeks without objection. So House Bill 1355 be rolled for two weeks, and that's item nine without objection. That's going to bring us to item two, House Bill 43. Uh, Representative Barrett, you got a motion and a second. You're properly, properly recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the first and, and the, uh, the motion and the second. House Bill 43 seeks to add an additional trial court judge for the 23rd Judicial District 
That is a, the judicial district that I have practiced in for 21 years. And if you look at every weighted case study going back for the last two decades, Dixon County, Hickman County, or Dixon, Humphreys, Houston, Stewart, and Cheatham County that make up this district has been in the bottom five counties underserved for judges. We've run anywhere from one to two judges below what we've needed. Plus, we've had all of the population growth as we've seen in the last census. Last census four out of the last five counties have seen double-digit population growth. Beyond that, Two of the counties in this district have also rolled their probate courts back into the Chancery Court, which has added additional stress and strain on the dockets for each of those counties. So I would love to have the support from this committee, the members of this committee, to support this bill to add an additional judge to the 23rd Judicial District. And thank you for that explanation. And I do agree there are certain parts of the state that is, is well under judged. So I'd like to see something be done about that. Myself. Members, any questions or comments? Uh, Chairlady Littleton, you recognize? I completely concur with the sponsor of the bill. So I, I live in Dixon County and it's much needed. Thank you. Very good. Members, anybody else before we vote? All right. Looks like we're voting to send House Bill 43 to finance. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Ayes have it. Bill moves on. Thank you, committee. All right. It brings us to item three, House Bill 190 by Representative Ritchie. Okay. Looks like you have an amendment as well, sir. Is that something you want to move forward? With 4750. This is the draft. Yes, Joe. All right. Very good. Got a motion and second. Members, we'll go ahead and vote to get this in proper form. Looks like we do. All those in favor to adopt House Amendment 4750 to the House Bill 190, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. I have it. Now we're back on the bill as amended. You recognize, sir. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Uh, this bill as amended uh, simply just allows, it, it continues, private businesses are allowed to post no weapons or firearms allowed inside completely believe that they have that right, which is in state code. Um, unfortunately, right now, there's no placement location of where that has to be. So we've got businesses that are placing the no firearm sign to where the opacity, you can't read it, or they're putting it down on the floor over in the corner to where individuals coming in could inadvertently be committing a Class C misdemeanor. All this does is say that that business that wants to put uh, the no firearms allowed has to put it no more than three foot from the entrance of the door in between 60 and 72 inches to the center, have a white background with black lettering. Um, and whenever I was in uh, the subcommittee, they asked me to do the arts and crafts. And since we're not allowed to have any props, I uh, provided that to uh, Leader Lambert at the beginning to be able to share with everybody. But uh, I stand by for any questions. Thank you, Chairman. Very good. And, and thank you for that. Um, Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, and, and I'll make light of, I don't want to make light of a serious bill, but Representative Ritchie, we did have a little fun with him last week and told him that if he's going to bring a bill that deals with signage, that he should personally create said signage. I will say he followed through with that. And for those, we have a large crowd of folks here today, understand that that is just um, one colleague to another. We had a little fun with the new member. So, but he did create that sign on his own and followed through with the actual um, sign and made it himself. So he did as, as the committee instructed. And for those that are watching today or here, we do that with a lot of young members to just have a little fun with them. They were elected by their constituents, but they're new to this body. So he followed through with the Mr. Chairman. Very good. And thank you, Leader Lambert. And, and we certainly appreciate you and, and all your hard work. I think this is very good policy to have a standardized um, size and, 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 and color and to demonstrate uh, for business to, to, for folks to know whether or not they can, carry firearms in there or not. So I think this is a good bill. Uh, members, uh, we ready to vote? Looks like we are. Looks like ready to vote to send House Bill 190 as amended to finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. I was have it. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Bill moves on. Brings us to item four, House Bill 985 by Representative Beck. And I do not know if he, yes, sir. I'm like, <laughs> I was looking for you. Here I here. am, I'm Mr. Blind. Chairman. I'm, motion. All right, you got a motion to second. You're probably recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a, a bill that comes from in 2019. Uh, we passed um, Public Chapter 151, uh, which limited the information that could be in court documents for minors. Uh, we we the bill says that I sponsored, and that this. Um, legislature passed said that uh, the full name of a minor could not appear in a court document, just uh, initials. 
uh, some unless it was uh, ordered by the court in some uh, judge's opinion, that meant on a parenting plan, for those of y'all who are don't do divorce work, a parenting plan is incorporated into the final decree of a divorce uh, by the court. And it, it talks about day-to-day -day schedules, holiday schedules, school vacation schedules, and parents' major decision, decision authority. And the form has a uh, child's name and date of birth uh, in the form. So some judges have said that they didn't want the child's name in the parenting plan. Uh, the, the office of the courts uh, felt it was necessary to have the child's name in the parenting plan. And so I'm bringing this on bill on behalf of the office of the courts. And all this bill does is clarifies that a child's name and birth date can appear on a parenting plan. Very good, very good. And thank you for that explanation. And, and it sounds like the, the AOC, the Administrative Office of the Courts, brought this bill to you to carry. And it uh, sounds mm -hmm. like it's just cleaning some things up there. They did, your, um, your, I almost said your honor. No, no. Uh, <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you, Mr. Not, Chairman. Not give me a panic. Uh, there. Uh, yeah. And we have uh, Charlie Baldwin here with the uh, administration office of the courts if we need any, if right. we have any questions. Okay. Members, we have any questions for Representative Beck? Seems pretty clear. Doesn't look, doesn't look like we do. Looks like we're ready to vote whether or not to send House Bill 985 to calendar and rule. So all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Ayes have it. Bill moves on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. You're welcome. Um, item five, House Bill 159, Representative Capley. Motion. You got a motion to second. You're probably recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. This is a pretty simple bill. It's an administration bill that I've been working on with uh, Leader Lambert. This would exempt the possession of carrying a pocket knife by a non-student adult from the offense of possessing or carrying on school property if the knife remains concealed at all times while the adult is on school property for the sole purpose of voting in an election for which the school is the adult's designated polling place. And for that, Mr. Chairman, I will submit for questions. And thank you for that explanation. Members, do we have any questions for Representative Capley? Lear Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. While, while this is a really, really good bill, I will only correct the representative on one thing. It is not an administration bill. Um, it, it is not something that Leader Cocker and I brought on behalf of the governor at their request. It is a really, really good bill, in my humble opinion, and it, and it fixes a quirk in the law that has been there for a while that doesn't really make any sense. But I did just want to throw that out there. And um, and Representative Capley is also one of our newer members. So I, I think he just meant that he hopes the administration through the governor's office might eventually sign this bill someday. And then it becomes an administration bill. Thank you, Chairman. Very good. Representative Capley, you're recognized, sir. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I apologize for misspeaking as I am new. So thank you. <laughs> it's all good. All right, members, any, anyone else? Comments, questions for Representative Capley before we vote? All right, seeing none, looks like we're ready to vote to send House Bill 159 to criminal full committee. Looks like it's going to be double referred, criminal full. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. I'll just have it. Boom, moves on. Brings item six, uh, House Bill 187 by Representative Bolso. You're probably recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, this is a bill to fill a gap in the law regarding uninsured motorist coverage. And specifically, it seeks to amend section 20-1-119 of our Tennessee code. And perhaps the best way to explain the purpose of the bill is with an illustration, because it involves a coverage that becomes available in the event of an automobile collision. So if in fact someone is hurt by someone running a red light, for example, uh, and re uh, receive serious injuries, the person may bring a lawsuit under our system of justice All right, someone's leaned against the light switch. So if you're if you're at the wall, just push, start pushing buttons. There you go, perfect. All right, now there you go. The lights are the lights went out on that one. All right, President Bolzo, you're, you're recognized, sir, to continue on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If someone's injured 
uh, seriously in an accident when, for example, someone runs a red light, uh, that person would have one year within which to bring an action to recover damages for personal injury. And uh, typically what occurs is that the, the plaintiff and the plaintiff's attorney would file that case on or about the one-year anniversary of the collision, so on day 365. Then the uh, defendant uh, would have a period of time within which to file an answer responding to the charges. And if, in fact, the defendant uh, did not have insurance or had very uh, small amount of insurance, uh, the plaintiff would also serve that complaint on the plaintiff's own insurance carrier pursuant to the uninsured motorist coverage provisions of that policy. And under current law, when the defendant files an answer, the defendant might name as a responsible party someone who was not already involved in the lawsuit. When that happens, the plaintiff has 90 days within which to bring that uh, newly identified responsible party into the lawsuit. That's the current effect of 20-1-119. But under Title 56, the uninsured motorist carrier also has the ability to file an answer in the case and to identify as a responsible party someone who is not yet in the lawsuit. Well, if the uninsured motorist carrier does that outside of the one-year statute of limitations currently, the plaintiff not, does not have that 90 days within which to bring this newly identified responsible party into the case. And with this bill, uh, simply does is to provide that same 90 days to the plaintiff to bring in a newly identified responsible party, just as the plaintiff has 90 days to do so when the uh, newly identified responsible party is named by a named defendant. And with that, Mr. Chairman, we'd move passage of the bill. Very good. And, and I noticed you had, I didn't want to interrupt you with that great explanation, but you do have an amendment uh, coded 4348. Does that rewrite the bill or? It, it does, Mr. Chairman, yes. Very good. Members, we'll, let's go ahead and adopt that amendment. I right. believe it's been explained. Thanks. Motion and second. All those in favor of adopting House Amendment 4348, House Bill 187, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. I have it. Back on the bill as amended. It's been, I believe, any questions or comments? Right. Hold on one second there. Um, uh, Representative Gant, you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative, is specifically what this is changing, is it the insured's insurance company, the uninsured motorist portion of their policy that they were affected by when they were hit by somebody that was uninsured. Is that, uh, you, you, you gave a great explanation. I'm just a little bit slow in trying to understand sometimes. So can you go back to that part where you're talking about, like if I'm hit by an uninsured motorist, is this affecting my very own insurance company under the uninsured motorist portion? You're right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Representative Gant, that is correct. That's exactly what this does. For those in the audience, many of you obviously have got automobile insurance. If you don't have it, you want to have as part of that policy this thing called uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage because it becomes more increasingly the case that you might be injured by someone who doesn't have insurance. And so you want to protect yourself against that risk. And as Representative Gant has, has asked, uh, when you bring a case against a responsible party, you also serve that that action on your own insurance carrier if the part party that you brought the case against doesn't have insurance or doesn't have very much. And what this bill does is simply give the plaintiff the ability to bring in, after the uh, expiration of the one-year statute of limitations, any party that's been identified by the uninsured motorist carrier. Great. That's 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 what I thought I heard. So thank you. Thank you. It's good. Members, any questions or comments for Representative Bolso before we vote? Right. Question has been called. Looks like ready to vote to send House Bill 187 as amended to calendar and rules. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Ayes have it. Bill moves on. It's item 7, House Bill 337 by Representative Stevens. I see two amendments here, sir, uh, 4185 and 4956. Is there either one of those or both of those you move want to move forward with? Uh, 4956. 4956. Does it make the bill? Yes. All right, members, we want to get in the, in the great motion Sorry. second. Looks like we're ready to vote whether or not to adopt House Amendment 4956 to House Bill 337. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Ayes have it. Now we're back on the bill as amended. Representative Stevens, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last year, the General Assembly passed some changes to the small estate law, 
and they had some unintended consequences. So this bill, as amended, uh, resolves those issues. Uh, we've worked very closely with the clerks. We've worked very closely with the bar association and with judges. And uh, this, what I thought was a simple one-page fix of that has turned into eight and a half rewrite of the statute. But I think everything's resolved. Everybody's happy with the way it is. And I think we're ready to move forward with it. So I would ask you to support that. Well, thank you for your hard work. Members, do you have any questions for Representative Stevens? Comments? Are we ready to vote? Looks like we are. We're voting to send House Bill 337 as amended to calendar and rules. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Ayes have it. Good job. Bill moves on. And now that brings us to item eight, House Bill 1103 by Chair Lady Littleton. And Chair Lady, you, you, I'm looking at two amendments here, 4588 and 4859. I'd like to go with 4859, and it does rewrite the bill. Okay, 4859 rewrites the bill, members. Do we want to go ahead and get that on the bill? Please. Got a motion and a second. Looks like we do. Um, all those in favor to adopt House Bill 4859, to, or excuse me, Amendment 4859 to House Bill 1103, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Ayes have it. Now we're back on the bill as amended. Charlie Littleton, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think all of you have heard me talk about the second look commission, uh, which is a dependent and neglect cases uh, that has done a lot of great work reviewing important cases so that we can really see what is and isn't working and what we need to do in order to improve. And these are the DCS uh, cases of the dependent and neglect children. So this would create a juvenile justice version of this commission. And this just says who will, uh, and it's for the delinquents of the juvenile uh, delinquents. And so this just puts in place who would be on the board and how it would conduct and when it would uh, take place. Okay, and, thank, and thank you for that. And appreciate all your hard work, uh, Chair Lady, on this cause. Members who have any questions for Chair Lady? Comments? Seeing none, looks like we're ready to vote whether or not to send House Bill 1103 to GovOps. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Ayes have it. Bill Thank moves you, Mr. on. Chairman and committee. Thank you. All right, that brings us back to the Hill of the calendar up to item one, House Bill 1005 by Representative Grills and Todd. Excuse me, Chairman Todd. I'm, I do apologize. You got a motion and a second. Looks like I'm looking at a couple of amendments here um, 4255 and 4717. Uh, Chairman, forty-seven seventeen is the correct amendment. Does that make the, Does that make the bill? It makes the bill. It makes the bill. Members, that makes the bill. We want to get that on there in a proper posture. Got a motion. Got a second. second. Looks like we do. All those in favor of adopting House Amendment forty-seven seventeen to House Bill one thousand five. Say aye. 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 Opposed. Say no. I was have it. And before we get started, um, I meant to mention this earlier. Let's just be aware of the doorways. Um, I'm going to let everybody stay in here because typically what we would do is if we have a lot of standing room and stuff, I'd, I'd ask people to step out and list their seats. I know how this is an important piece of legislation, so I want people to be able to be here to see what's going on. So, But if everybody just keeps the doorways clear for the fire marshal and this, that, and the other so we don't get in any trouble um, and just watch the light switch and and <laughs> that way lights stay on. And Chairman Todd, you recognize. I apologize for the interruption. Oh, not at all, sir. Thank you. To comply with the civil right indicated within the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, this bill removes the infringement of that civil right within our code by flipping the language currently found in our statutes. It removes the offense in 1307A1, this is uh, 3917, 1307A1, but does not remove any current crimes or create any new crimes related to carrying a firearm except for 18 to 20 year olds when considering the current exceptions and defenses. As we've been recently instructed numerous times by several courts, our restrictions on the civil rights of 18 to 20 year olds to keep and bear arms is unconstitutional. This bill corrects that throughout. Since the Constitution and numerous recent court decisions have reiterated our civil right to keep and bear arms and not simply pistols, this bill changes the word handgun to firearm throughout the code where it applies. The last thing this bill does is to state the obvious, excuse me, this, this this portion was deleted in this last uh, amendment. So um, those are the things this does. Basically three different things by changing our language, not creating any new crimes or relieving any crimes that we currently have on the books, but relieving that infringement on the Second Amendment, allowing 18 to 20 year olds to carry constitutionally and with permits as we have been ordered by court and changing handgun to firearm throughout the code. And I'll be glad to take questions. Very good, members, and I'd be happy if members want to uh, field questions now. 
to Chairman Todd. I do have a, a lengthy list of folks that want to come and testify on this bill. So it's up to the committee. What y'all want to do? You want to take questions for uh, Chairman Todd now, or you want to go to session? All right. Looks like the committee wants to will is to go out of session and hear from our speakers today. So without objection, we're out of session, and we're going to hear um, from Miss Kathy Barnett. Kathy, are you there? Thank you. Ms. Barnett, if you would go ahead and I know I've already I'm said your name once to introduce testify yourself. Today. I'm sorry, what? I'm denying to testify today. So you're going to waive? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then we're, we're, next is Zach uh, Mayhee. Mayhee? I'm sorry, I, if I mispronounce your name, I do apologize. If you, and you'll be able to correct it there if you just sit down and announce your name and be sure that red light's on. You'll have three minutes, sir. Try that. Hit that red. Be sure that red light's on right in front of you. Microphone. On the microphone. Yeah. Oh, it's on. Okay. Do it, do it again. Now it's on. It is on. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. You have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, distinguished members of the House Civil Justice Committee. Thank you for hearing me speak again, this time on House Bill 1005. My name is Zach Maya, and I'm a student at Vanderbilt University. I'm a volunteer with Every Town for Gun Safety and Students Demand Action. I strongly oppose House Bill 1005 and encourage you all not to advance this dangerous proposal. This isn't my first time speaking to your committee. I was here nearly a year ago on speaking about a very similar bill, House Bill 1735. But I'm back because y'all didn't stop trying and we did not stop watching. Since I joined the gun violence prevention movement in over three years ago, the most hurtful experiences I've had are when legislators hear their constituents' calls to action and claim to care about American lives, yet fail to commit to any real action, sometimes even scaling back common sense gun laws. In Tennessee, for instance, the rate of gun deaths have increased 52% from 2012 to 2021, compared to a 39% increase nationwide, costing our state $18 billion a year. But instead of enacting popular gun law reform, this legislature passed a permitless carry law opposed by 59% of Tennessee voters. And today it's considering expanding it. Many of you in this room have echoed calls for law and order in this country and claim to back the blue. If you've ever made similar remarks, I want you to consider every law enforcement officer interacting with civilians when you vote on this bill. Permitless carry puts police officers' lives in danger. It's the reason that states that pass these laws see a rise in fatal shootings by police and that the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, the Tennessee Sheriff's Association, and the Tennessee Association of Chiefs of Police all opposed permitless carry in 2021. If you really do care about Tennessee's police officers, please take a moment to consider them as you look at this bill. People aged 18 to 20 are three times more likely to commit gun homicides than those 21 and older. This bill would make any danger caused for any, any danger to police and the Tennessee public caused by the 2021 20, permitless carry law significantly worse. Personally, I know far too many people who have had to bury friends and family or have experienced trauma themselves as a result of gun violence, including the family of Toledo police officer Anthony Dia, who was shot and killed just responding to a call just six miles from where I grew up. As a senator in my student government, while maybe just a little less influential, I know what the pressures are of having to appease many people with different opinions. Like you, I've faced pressure from every person in a room to vote for a certain resolution. And I've even been the only senator to vote no on something that I didn't believe would help the students I was elected to serve. In that same way, I'm asking each of you to consider the implications this bill will have and make the choice that reflects what Tennessee actually wants and needs in this moment, regardless of how you may have been lobbied to vote. I know, and I'm sure you all know, this will only put Tennesseans in danger. So on behalf of every American and other person at risk of being harmed by this bill, I'm begging you to please vote no. Very good. And, and thank you for that. Members, do you have any questions for our guest? Uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Oh, Representative Parkinson. I should have known so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm joking. I was joking. <laughs> Appreciate so, first, th thank you for being here. Um, what was that percentage of increase that you mentioned earlier? It was 52% over 10 years. Give, give me, give me that, that full statement of what you were saying. 
50, so, so we can put it in context. The rate of gun deaths increased 52% from 2012 to 2021, compared to a 39% increase nationwide. And that 52% that okay. increase was in the state of Tennessee? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that. Resident Kaplan, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you tell us where you got those statistics from? Those statistics? Mm -hmm. um, so every town for gun safety... Uh, has a an organization called Every Town Re Every Town Research, and they conduct a lot of research and pile um, research done by different universities and um, organizations, and they produce uh, statistics like that. So if you go to EveryTownResearch.org, they have a lot more information like that. President Kaplan, so this information came strictly from your organization, nowhere else. I'm not exactly sure. Well, the organization found the information, yes, but I believe it comes from law enforcement agencies across the country. Okay. All right, Resident Kapsley, any follow-up? You, do you believe, I mean, I'm just asking, so you say you believe that's where it came from, or do you know? You're right, Um, I believe it came from governments and the CDC and other organizations. Um, I'm not, yeah. Members, anyone else? Chair Lady Littleton, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you have the ages of the shooters of that 52%? I don't have the exact ages. Um, I just know that people aged 18 to 20 are much more at risk to commit gun violence that compared to those 21 and older. Um, that's caused by a lot of different factors. Um, but it's just been proven across the nation that people aged 18 to 20 are much more likely to commit gun violence. Chair Letty, you recognize? I was talking about juveniles. Do you have a number on them? How many of them were juveniles? I don't. Can you get that? Sure, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman. It'd be great. If you get that information, you can just email it to, to my office or Chair Lady Littleton there. Okay. Uh, and we'll disperse that. Uh, Chairman Russell, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And did you say the research goes up to 2021? Yes. Do you have anything from 2021 to now? I don't. I think they're still compiling that data um, just because it's so soon after 2021. Uh, Chairman, you recognize? I was just curious because that's when our permitless carry went into effect. So thank you. Yeah. Very good. Members, anyone else? Chairman Grills? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just real quick, if you don't mind. You said it went from 32 to how, what was the percentage 30 up from the, that gun deaths increased yes uh 52 percent in tennessee and that was 39 percent what, what, what nationwide. was that was that actual number you, the percentage you're given the percentage but what was the actual number the number of gun deaths of number, number of gun deaths um i'm not sure we can find that and, and, and get it back and to how you. many of those were suicide i believe across the nation suicide typically is around 60 something percent of gun deaths so was there an uptick in suicide between 12 and 22, whenever that? I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Those, those are all good questions and would, would certainly be relevant, the, the numbers of folks versus percentages and then um, having us being able to know, unfortunately, what percentage of that and numbers were related, suicide related and, and some specifics there. But uh, uh, members, any other questions or comments for our speaker? All Can right. I add another just final thing. Sure, go ahead. Thought. Yeah, um, suicide does contribute a big percentage of those uh, gun deaths, but I know that gun homicides have increased uh, in that same time period. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I do know that they have increased significantly. Okay. And, and thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all we have for you. And just once again, thank appreciate you. your time. All right, brings us up next. I'm going to call up Commissioner Long and uh, Director Rausch. Commissioner Long with the Department of Safety and uh, Director Rausch with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. And you all are more than welcome to bring up, if you've got folks with you that, that may be able to help answer some questions after you're finished uh, with your with your um, testimony there, we'd be happy to hear from them as well. Okay. 
and either either commissioner can start. Each of you, I'll give you you both three minutes apiece, and then we can. If Mr. Easley wants, I guess maybe here for the governor's office, I'll allow you also three minutes. I think that's fair. So, Commissioner Rouse, if you or excuse me, Director Rouse, if you want to start off. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thanks to the committee. Um, so, so I want to uh, express the uh, uh, the concern that we have uh, at the bureau in terms of this legislation. Um, we do oppose. Uh, the legislation in, in, uh, in some very specific parts in, in terms of changing the terminology from handgun to firearm. Um, and, and the reasoning behind that. So uh, our, our concerns are evidence from other states that have done this. And what we have seen in these other states is uh, the challenge. And we look at places like Texas and Ohio, where uh, individuals are allowed to carry whatever they choose to carry uh, in public. And when they do that, what happens is public alarm goes up, uh, not surprisingly. So if someone's carrying a long gun uh, in public, um, either down their street or into a, 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 a business that allows uh, these types of things, uh, public alarm goes up, which uh, so there's two challenges there. One is on those who are legally carrying uh, and and then the other is on law enforcement. The one on those legally carrying, of course, uh, puts them in a position of trying to make a decision on the safety of themselves and others. And uh, and so what we've seen in these other states is where that conflict happens. And so that that is a challenge where you have a citizen who thinks that they have someone who might be trying to harm someone, um, carrying a long gun uh, into an establishment or in front of residences uh, for intimidation purposes. And they they approach and they confront, and then that becomes a challenge, which could result in uh, in gunfire happening, even potential homicides. Uh, same thing with law enforcement; it causes alarm to be uh, uh, put forward. People call law enforcement to uh, come and check these situations out. When law enforcement approaches, then they are trying to determine, you know, the purpose of the person's carry and why, if they are carrying legally or illegally, and what's their intent. Um, again, moves into some challenging situations where ultimately something bad could happen uh, and, and has happened. And, and, and so those challenges are concerned to the Bureau because we ultimately uh, get called in to investigate many of these types of situations where firearms are used. And so it would certainly cause a, an increase in workload for the Bureau. Second concern, and this is uh, and, and it's not a secret, I have done a, a public service announcement on the challenge that Tennessee has with firearm security. Um, we do lead the nation in firearm thefts. And so that is a major concern. If we increase the number and the types of firearms uh, that, are, that are being carried uh, and potentially left uh, unsecured, then we're also opening up that opportunity for those guns to fall into the hands of criminal element, which is where they've been falling. And so that that is a major concern that we have as well. And so to look and, and to point to the constitutional um, uh, question, I think is important. I have read uh, thoroughly through uh, the the New York case uh, on Bruin. And as I've read through that, Justice Thomas was very clear in his response. Uh, this was about handguns. It wasn't about long guns. Uh, the New York case is about handguns. He made it very clear in his response that um, they were holding their ruling consistent with the Heller case, which is the District of Columbia versus Heller, another Supreme Court case that has set the standard for states to make regulation on firearms. And that standard is reasonable regulation. And so what we're asking is that reasonable regulation be recognized in, in the state of Tennessee. One uh, quote I wanna give you straight from the case from Justice Thomas, we noted that like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. From Blackstone through the 19th century cases, commenters and courts routinely explained that the right was not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner whatsoever for whatever purpose. Uh, it, for example, we found it fairly supported by the historical tradition of prohibiting the carry of da dangerous and unusual weapons. And so those that, that, that was straight from Justice Thomas. So I, I would caution that uh, there's not a real need in Tennessee to expand this. Very good. And I appreciate that. Uh, your three minutes is up, sir. And we'll have unlimited time for questions and, and have more comments. Uh, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> good, good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, you've heard a lot of testimony on this, so I'm not going to 
uh, rehash the testimony that you've heard. But I do have about three points that I did want to raise and make uh, known to the committee. And Director Rouse is exactly right. One of my main concerns is the safety of the officers in Tennessee. All the, the first line responders who work here in our state, um, having someone with a long gun being accessible more so and safety of that officer. Uh, also the issue of theft of vehicles. We all see in the news every day about theft of so firearms from our vehicles. And as he says, this is certainly gonna raise the number of firearms out on the street uh, for people who are stealing them. But even more important is we have worked very, very hard in the last two years or so to teach de-escalation to our officers. And we've tried to teach them to de-escalate on all situations where they're meeting the public. This is going to reverse that. This will naturally escalate the situation when an officer sees someone with a long gun, when all that officer has is the firearm on his side. So I am concerned about that and about reversing all the work we've done on de-escalation. And lastly, I wanna remind the body that those of you who have been here for a short period or for a period of time, and those of you who may not have been here as long, we had this situation about 10 years ago here in Nashville, where we had an individual that was carrying an AK-47 with a pistol grip and walking around buildings around Nashville, and it was legal because it was registered as a pistol. However, I can tell you from the experience, uh, I had it happen in Franklin, Tennessee, when I was sheriff, and the panic and the concern that it caused for the public cannot be underestimated. People were very, very fearful. Uh, this individual was walking around Radnor Lake, where a lot of individuals go to exercise. He was walking around downtown Nashville in some of the buildings. So just, I, I ask you to remember that, that that's what happened then, and that's exactly what Director Roush is talking about and is gonna happen this time, because the first time an individual sees somebody with a long gun, they're not gonna know what the situation is or whether they're legal to carry or not, but they are gonna call law enforcement and ask us to respond to it. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. Very good, and thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Easley, you recognize, you just introduce yourself to the committee and you've got three minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Brent Easley, the uh, legislative director for the governor. Um, I, th I think most of what I have to share today is similar to the, the two gentlemen before me. Uh, as we've looked at this legislation and talked with the governor about it, um, his position on this is that he is opposed to it with his, uh, his main concern being the change from handgun to firearm and, and what that would look like as a public policy matter and in practice. Uh, so I'm here today to share that and um, happy to take any questions on that as well. Very good. And thank you for that. All right, members, questions or comments for any of our guests? I have Representative Balso on the list first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is for Director Roush. Thank you for being here. Yeah, specifically, I want to ask you uh, questions about the Second Amendment, Heller, and the Bruin decision, because you obviously raised both Bruin and Heller in your comments, uh, Director. First, I mean, you agree that this committee has to act in accordance with the Second Amendment, correct? And thank and, you. Um, and yes, sir. Here's, here's, I think here's what we can do. If y'all can just have, I'm I'm not going to recognize you guys every time. Thank so you. I know you all will be respectful. <laughs> Everybody in this committee will be respectful. Every person down there. So thank you, Go Chairman. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I, I I would agree that uh, following the Second Amendment, but also following the rulings of the Supreme Court, who uh, who provides us the guidance in law enforcement on on the application of the Second Amendment. Sure. So you you would agree that if the Second Amendment required that citizens be permitted to carry not just handguns, but long guns in public, then this committee would be obligated to vote in favor of HB 1005, correct? Yeah, I, I, I can't agree completely to that, Representative, because the rulings of the court is what we have to agree to. The Second Amendment doesn't explicitly provide direction on this. The courts have provided the clarification of the application, even Justice Thomas uh, provides that in his ruling in Bruin. Sure. And Justice Thomas in Bruin relied heavily on Justice Scalia's opinion in Heller, correct? That's absolutely correct. And one of the things that Justice Scalia focused on in Heller was that the Second Amendment is comprised of two clauses, a prefatory clause and an operative clause, correct? Correct. And the prefatory clause is, quote, 
a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Close quote, correct? Close. That's that's the prefatory clause. When you say close, have I missed it somewhere? No, I I, I think that's a close okay. I think sure. that's a close close quote. Okay. I, I don't well, know it's exact, but well the full second amendment close. says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, correct? Absolutely. And you understand that what the Second Amendment was doing was not creating a right, but rather codifying a pre-existing right, correct? Correct. And in, in, in Heller, Justice Scalia said that based on the prefatory clause, it's clear that the weapons that the Second Amendment had in mind and that the framers had in mind were weapons that were commonly in use at the time, correct? That's correct. And and so he he very specifically said that the kinds of weapons that one has an individual right to own are the same kinds of weapons used in the militia, correct? Uh, I'm not sure that that he dug into that. I'm, okay, I'm not well, sure he he went that far. Well, I mean, I can I, I can quote from from the opinion section three of of his opinion. I, I think he was talking about muskets. If if I. <laughs> Exactly. I'm, exactly. I'm, and and you will agree that. Sure. Okay. Let's it, it precisely. Just, let, me just, let me make this clear. Hold on. Let's. We're we're here. We're going to be quiet. We're going to listen. No laughing. No. Let's keep our comments to ourselves. Let's be respectful in this room while we're here. Please. All right. Crimson Bozo, you recognize? Sure. And you will agree that a musket is a long gun, correct? It it is. Okay. And on on page uh, six twenty seven of Heller. I mean, Justice Scalia said, among other things, that the Second Amendment secured a right, quote, to bring the sorts of lawful weapons that they possessed at home to militia duty, close quote. So if, in fact, the Supreme Court is telling us that the Second Amendment protects the right to keep and bear not just pistols or handguns, but long guns, you would agree that Justice Scalia's opinion is authoritative for this committee, correct? I I would agree, yes. In that he, he was he was also talking about. Now you got to remember the District of Columbia case was about in your home. It wasn't about out in public, and so Heller was about what you could have in your home, not about what you could carry in public. And so uh, that that's so yes, you can have the long guns in your home. That's it didn't extend outside the home in the Heller case. Uh, no, but Bruin discussed specifically the Sullivan Law in New York, which dealt with carrying a gun outside of your home, correct? Carrying the handgun. And Justice Thomas and Bruin incorporated the analysis that Justice Scalia gave us in Heller. Isn't that true? In addressing handguns. Sure. So we've got the Supreme Court of the United States saying in Heller and by adoption uh, in Bruin that the Second Amendment applies both to handguns and to long guns. That is guns that were commonly used in use at the time of the American Revolution for militia. And so what you are attempting to do, let's to be clear, you're, you're attempting to limit the Second Amendment right to carry outside of one's home to handguns, not to long guns, correct? What I am saying is that the court ruled that states have the authority to reasonably regulate firearms. And so uh, in, in the Again, in the Bruin case, it was about handguns, and, and even Justice Thomas recognizes that. There's a quite a bit of discussion in the Bruin case about the fear that is caused by dangerous other types of weapons. And so that has to be considered when considering regulation. And so the, the, the court still recognizes that states have the authority to reasonably regulate firearms and the manner that they are carried and and where they are carried and how they are carried and 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 when they can be carried that that is recognized continuously by the Supreme Court. Well, is, do you agree, um, Detective Roush, that the Second Amendment protects one's right to carry semi-automatic pistols in public? It it, it does say that people can carry uh, a, a handgun. I asked a more specific question. I mean, do you agree that under the Second Amendment, citizens have a right to carry a semi-automatic pistol in public? A absolutely. And your position is somehow we're supposed to read the Second Amendment to provide that a citizen can carry a semi-automatic handgun into public, but not a semi-automatic rifle. Is that correct? What I'm saying is there's a difference, yes. And you will agree there's nothing in the language of the Second Amendment to support the distinction that you're making. 
it's Isn't not that that there's not anything specific in the Second Amendment that says yes or no to this, right? The the rulings of the court is what gives us guidance on what can and cannot fall under the Second Amendment. And so I would say that based on the rulings of the court, you still have the authority under the, as a state, we still have the authority to limit what is carried. Is, is and that's that's what I that, that's the point that was made in in Bruin and the point that's made in Heller. Well, how how do you deal, Director Roush, with the language from Justice Scalia and Heller that states specifically that the Second Amendment protects the rights of citizens to bear and carry the types of weapons that one commonly used in the militia at the time that the Second Amendment was adopted? So again, we're talking about muskets, and and so if we're talking about allowing people to carry muskets on the street. I guess if you want to do that, I, I would be open to that. But uh, keep in mind that a musket is much different than a than a, a an auto or semi-auto fired rifle, uh, and and that the ability so that the types of firearms have changed dramatically. I think you can agree uh, over the years, and 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 the law as as interpreted the the amendment is interpreted by the Supreme Court takes that into consideration as well and gives guidance on that. It, it, they've given that guidance in Bruin. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, sir. Um, next on the list, I have Representative Beck. Sir, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Roush informed us about the uh, leading the nation in firearm thefts. Very alarming. Do any does do, does TBI or safety or anybody have those exact numbers for the last three years? Say, I do. Yes. Uh, thank you, Representative. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, so I can I can tell you. So the total numbers of firearms stolen from vehicles, um, I can go from 2018 to 2022. I have the numbers. Here. That'd be great. So 9,629 in 18, 8,704 in 19, 9,224 in 20, 9,502 in 21, and 9,413 in 22. What was 22? I'm sorry, I was wrong. 9,413. So ve that's very alarming. So one of, I believe that you stated that one of your great concerns was that people would, uh, if, if we had these long guns out on the streets, um, uh, they would leave them in their cars or some other place, that they would be stolen like these uh, handguns are being stolen. Was that... One of your concerns, Director Rouse. It, it is a concern. I can give you the numbers on from theft from motor vehicle as well. So those are total numbers that I gave you first. Then motor vehicle thefts. 18 is 4,021. 19 is 3,788. 20 is 4,397. 21, 4,859. And 22, 5,301 firearms. And, and that's... From motor vehicles alone. Yes, sir. Because I know here in Davidson County, we've got an epidemic of, of guns being stolen from vehicles. And from your statistics that you just gave me, there's over a 1,300, approximately a 1,300 um, gun increase from uh, 2018 to 2022. Is that correct? That's, I think you're right there. Yes, sir. Approximately. Okay. And so if if we make these handguns, AR-15s, et cetera, uh, legal to take up and down Broadway and uh, Cumberland Avenue in Knoxville and uh, Beale Street in Memphis, uh, then if somebody, this could aid in more guns being on the streets. That That is a concern. And that concern comes from just the evidence that we know uh, is that uh, we have seen firearm thefts increase. Uh, as they have been uh, more available, uh, people uh, choosing to carry, and that's fine. I, I have no problem with one a person that is legally able to carry a handgun to carry a handgun. And uh, the problem is, is when they leave them in their vehicles, they're leaving vehicles unsecure and they're leaving the firearms unsecure. What I see is the potential here is uh, allowing the long guns as well, then they are going to also be left in vehicles, uh, uh, allowing uh, the theft of those, those long guns uh, to to obviously uh, increase. 
my local police officers have been telling me about how many of these guns that are stolen from cars, the cars aren't even locked. It's just, I, it just blows my mind uh, how we're just letting these guns into the hands of, of criminals. We, we um, up the, um, I believe it was last year, the year before, we upped uh, the penalty for stealing a gun. And uh, that doesn't seem to have helped bring the numbers down at all. It has not. Um, very good. And and Commissioner Long, do I have? Yes, you do. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Long, tell me about how when you, your officers would uh, would approach, or could they even approach, without any probable cause, somebody walking up and down Broadway with an AK. Uh, AR-15. As I understand, the statute will change to where you cannot ask anyone why or if they're permitted to carry the weapon. And you, you in, your, in your opening comments, you talked about how uncomfortable people are and about how they call the, the police and the sheriff uh, when, they, when, they, when they see this situation. Yes. So... Um, this is this is very 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 disconcerting for the public. Yes. Very good. Thank you all for being here today, and thank you for your your input. Uh, and thank you, Representative Beck. Uh, Representative Parkinson, you recognize? Thank thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you thank you all for being here. Also, I'm just I'm a visual person, so I'm trying to see this in my head. Um, in the in the in some of the communities, you know, um, that I represent, so. If if and 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 hopefully I'm wrong. So I'm I'm hoping you tell me I'm wrong with this. So if this law passes, then uh, let's say young juvenile, eighteen, right, has a juvenile record, but we can't see it. Um, is is going into a gas station with an assault rifle, and the the gas station clerk calls is there anything that can be done thank you representative parkson yes the police will be called and they will respond but as the law will state they will not be allowed to ask the intention or whether they have any reason to have that weapon or uh, permit wise or anything as i understand it so in, in that case, what would be the purpose of the response? To make a report. So, and, and I just want to see this. So, and, and then if that's the case, then then this, this young individual, uh, let, let's say, for instance, then you have a group of individuals with assault rifles in a vehicle and sitting in front of a bank. No, I'm serious. Mm -hmm. Sitting in front of a bank. Um, let's say they got mask on their head, but not pulled down, but they're sitting in front of a bank. And and they get out of that car. Let's say they get out of that car and actually, let's say they got mask on. Is there no crime has been committed? At that point, no. However, it probably would give reasonable suspicion or probable okay. cause to do further interviews. And if you determined that the possession was for the intent of robbing the bank, then you would have a violation. Okay. That would be it. Direct for us. Yeah, I, I would add if now the, the challenge on that is depending on the mask. If you're wearing a protective COVID mask. No, right? seriously. Exactly. Um, then there wouldn't be a legal right to inquire why they're there with long guns and a and wearing their protective mask uh and so there would not be a, a, a legal reason for us to ask if if and if you don't mind my indulgence mr chair if there's a situation of a shootout how do how does law enforcement determine who's the good guy who's the bad guy So the investigative process would hopefully bear that out. Um, and that that's really, it'll depend on the investigative process to determine what the facts 
of the situation were. And that's that's the challenge that that it puts law enforcement in. Um, and so it, then we have to determine what's going on. And and if it's a law enforcement shooting, then obviously it's the challenge for the bureau uh, to determine uh, what the facts of the case are. And, and thank you for that, um, director. The 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 scenario I'm I'm thinking about though is during the response. How does law enforcement determine who's the good guy and who's the bad guy in an active shootout? Well, as I testified earlier, it's going to be the problem because anything we may have learned during de-escalation, it's automatically going to escalate when an officer arrives. I've been at 49 years, and if you arrive on the scene and you see somebody with a long gun that has an advantage over you with a sidearm, your escalation goes up automatically. So it's going to be difficult for law enforcement. And in the scenario you're painting, uh, Representative, I'd say that there is no way to determine. If you've got two parties shooting at each other, you don't know. And so that's going to become where law enforcement then has to, you know, make a split second decision on what the right thing to do at that moment. And it's uh, and that's going to determine, you know, the, what happens forward from there. So it's uh, it, it is a complicated mess. Uh, and, and my last question is, um, with the possibilities of, of this law passing, uh, how does this affect recruitment? It'll be, it, we'll have to wait and see, but I expect that uh, the recruits that we're looking at now that have never been in law enforcement uh, think it's even a challenge even to apply for law enforcement with the sentiment of the of the country right now and the dangers of the job. And this is certainly going to increase the dangers of the job and it's probably going to actually hurt recruitment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Next on the list, I have uh, Chairman Grills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Safety, for being here. Obviously, we uh, have a philosophical disagreement on this because uh, I feel like that it's my job and the oath that I took to defend the Constitution, whether I agree with it or not. And I believe you guys took that same oath. And um, I uh, feel like that we are doing everything that I can, Chairman Todd and some others, we're working together trying to, to restore our constitutional rights. Uh, Commissioner Long, you brought up a situation that took place on uh, down here in Nashville on Broadway. Governor Lee, a few years ago, I mean, two years ago, Brent Easley, you uh, made reference to it, the constitutional carry, I appreciate Governor Lee and his leadership on that. I voted for it, supported it 100%. But you referenced a gun that is legal to carry under constitutional carry that Governor Lee pushed. That conversation that you're having today should have been had when constitutional carry was brought forth. It was. And, well. <laughs> it was. And, but, but and, so, so the gun that you're referencing is not even relevant to this actual uh, uh, change in law that we're talking about today. No, this was prior to constitutional carry. And what actually happened was, and I think everybody was surprised, I know all law enforcement was surprised, that because it had the length of the handle, the grip, it had a like a pistol grip rather than the stock of the weapon, according to the federal ATF regulations, uh, because of the length of it, that made it a legal handgun rather than a rifle, as all of law enforcement assumed at the time. Yes. Yep. I want to pull just a scenario here and get back to what where this originally come from. If I'm driving down the road and I run out of gas, I'm, I'm a short distance from my house, and we've all heard about not leaving your vehicle guns in your vehicles. I get out of my truck throw my, get my bag in one shoulder and throw my rifle on the other shoulder. And I'm walking down the road. A police officer pulls up and asks me, uh, what are you doing? Am I committing a crime? And under 1307A, I am committing a crime. And that's what we feel like we are trying to write here. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that, so is the rifle loaded? Is that what you're saying? I, I have the magazine in my pocket. I'm sorry? I have the, I have the ammo on me. But it, it's it's going to be a, 
a judgment call by that officer in terms of if there's a crime being committed. I mean, if you your explanation will help the officer make a determination on whether there's a charge brought for a crime. But am and I breaking I would, the law would, is my question. Am I'm I sorry. breaking the law if I put my guns Not, in my truck, walking down, walking to my house to get the gas can, but I don't want to leave the gun in my truck. I have the magazine in my gun. It's got three, uh, three rounds in it, and a sheriff's deputy pulls me over. Am I breaking the law? I, w- I would tell yes, you're, you're going armed at that point. However, I, I, I would ask them, I mean, here's, here's where sense is, right? This is where the sensibility of, of those of us who, who lawfully carry firearms, right, is what's the purpose of carrying it armed at that point? Why, why not leave the bullets in the vehicle while you carry your firearm home to keep it from getting stolen? So there's some, there's some common sense come to play, I think. In this, and so uh, if if I was in that scenario, I would not keep it armed. I would leave the bullets behind and take the gun. And if I'm stopped by law enforcement, explain what's going on. And every law enforcement officer I've known for the past 36 years that I've been in this business would tell you that they most of them would open the door and say, "Let's let me drive you home, or let me drive you to get some gas," and they would take care of you. So um, I, I, I I get what you're saying, but I, I would tell you that common sense would tell you don't carry it armed. That's the way you keep from violating the law. I think it's, un, I think it's unfortunate though, not a person up here would think that I would be committing a crime, but yet you just admitted that that is a crime. And I feel like that's unfortunate. And that's the reason for this legislation. I, and, you know, obviously we disagree here, but that doesn't mean that we can't be agreeable and, uh, and work on other issues and support you in almost everything else that you do. But uh, I just feel like you guys have an oath that you've taken and that you should be defending the constitutional, uh, constitution of the United States and Tennessee and not a philosophical view. If Thank I you. may, Mr. Chair, I, 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 I've, been, I've been sworn to that oath since right. 1986 when I served the United States Army. And so I will, I will tell you that I absolutely believe in my oath and I have supported my oath and I continue to support that oath. And so we, we will disagree that I believe even this, I'm supporting my right. right. And, and, and thank you for that. I, I, and, you know, we're all here. I mean, we're on the same team here. You know, we're going to disagree on, on some policy, right? And I, and I know Chairman Grills didn't mean anything personal to, to your beliefs and your oath to this country and this, and this state. I know that wasn't the case. So and we, know, we know that too, and I know that. Yes, Chairman Grills. If, if I may, I'm sorry. Yes, there's not any derogatory thoughts, intentions at all, anything I have to say about you or anyone up right. there. Right. We just see things different, and I hope you understand that. You know my heart. Right. Anything else? Okay, very good. Next on the list, I have uh, Representative Powell. You're recognized, sir. Uh, thank you. If, if I could, cause I know we've talked a lot about scenarios and <clears throat> run through different you know, scenarios here um you mentioned an episode here at radnor which is actually fairly close to my my house my district um when these incidents occur is it usually one officer that responds or do do multiple law enforcement usually engage in those situations that depends totally upon the location and the availability of the officers responding uh, in Metro Nashville, you might have enough in that precinct to have a backup car doing it. If it was out on the interstate somewhere and one of our troopers were to be involved, they would be by themselves until another uh, agency could get to them or another trooper could get to them. So, uh, But once they see that rifle, they automatically become on guard uh, once they pull up onto the scene. And. In- is there anything, I guess, as you read this law that would, would expand protections or, you know, say these in- incidents happen close to a school or close to a preschool or close to a concert um, or a nightclub with multiple people present, um, where we know that unfortunately a lot of these uh, different um, tragic shootings have occurred. Is there anything within the law that you see as this is written that would give those protections? Say, you know, there was someone who maybe the school had, um, if it was a, a school, if they had maybe expelled that student and, and then were to see that student you know, with a gun like that, is there anything that you 
would, would expand your abilities to offer more protection? Either one of you two, you're recognized. Or... I'm, I'm, I may need you to repeat just the last part of it so I can make sure I fully understood it. Sure. Just, I mean, is there anything in this legislation as it's contemplated to give extra, you know, cause for law enforcement when, when, if, when this is, you know, when you see something in a, an environment with a lot of um, people present to offer a, uh, more protection? Hey, Mr. Tucker, would you go ahead and just uh, introduce yourself for the folks that may not know you, may be watching, not here uh, for your record? Absolutely. Elizabeth Stroker, Legislative Director and Assistant General Counsel for the Department of Safety. Um, short answer is no. You would you would have people carrying outside of those type of buildings or situations. And as long as they do not pose anything for law enforcement to be uh, have reasonable belief to stop them for a crime, um, there, there's no there's nothing in there to give them an out if they feel like in their gut there's something they need to look into further. No. You recognize good. So, so essentially, if you had a demonstration with a lot of people around a school building, um, there's no extra protection there. And you couldn't even inquire and ask them if they were not committing a crime. If they had these weapons present, you could not then ask them if they're permitted, non-permitted. Is that correct? Y'all can go ahead and have them back and forth. Just don't talk over one another. Um Correct. However, there are limitations on carrying on school grounds and school property. So that's assuming we're not violating those laws that dictate you cannot carry on school grounds or school property. So if you're right outside of what you cannot carry on, you you would be correct. Yes. And, and I have a very serious question. I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm being very serious. Um, are the type of weapons that you see um, that you would find in these types of situations are they beyond what a typical person would possess or have in 1776 when the Constitution was ratified? Uh, yes, Representative, obviously. Um, they are, are completely different. Uh, you know, we have, we have firearms now that, that, that you can fire multiple rounds uh, and uh, they, they chamber firearms differently. The, fi the, the, the rounds themselves are different. Uh, considerably. So yes, it, there is a, a major difference between firearms today and then what we had in uh, in the 1700s. Any more questions, Representative Powell? All right, very good. Next on the list, I have um, Vice Chair Jernigan. You recognize, sir? Thank you. Thank you, and and, and Director, I want to I want to talk about the Constitution a little bit in the Second Amendment we've been speaking about, and um. I think when we talk about Heller and Broome, that it's uh, it's an interpretation of the Second Amendment. And so in, the, in 1787, when, when they're discussing the Second Amendment, Washington and then uh, Jefferson were terrified of a, of a standing army. European governments fail uh, because of standing armies in peacetime. And so it was. It was written to to defend a a, a free nation. And in 1787, in the ratifying convention in Virginia, Patrick Henry stood up and said, "Whoa, whoa, we can't do a a, a defending nation. We have to do a state, because in Virginia, our militia is the slave patrol. So I can't have them off defending the nation when this is happening." Those are the two reasons for the Second Amendment. So in 1812. Here comes the British, they go into New York, they burn the White House, and you know who didn't show up? The militia. And ever since 1812, we've had a standing army. And then after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, slave patrol was off the table. Then you fast forward 100, 150 years, there were no federal cases on the Second Amendment. There was one in Tennessee. Met versus Tennessee in the 1840s. The Supreme Court Justice of Tennessee said, because we're talking about bearing arms, bearing arms at the time meant military service. The justice says you can hunt delk, I mean elk, deer, buffalo for 40 years and never bear arms. So we fast forward to Hillary, and I know a lot of my friends that say Scalia is this um, originalist context of the Constitution, he was an activist judge and rewrote the Constitution that day 
absolutely rewrote it to where we are today. And that's fine. Under Article 3, they're allowed to do that. We disagree with different interpretations of it. But, but now that we are under Hillary and Broome, and I get that. I understand. But I don't want us to, 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 for us to say, well, the Second Amendment, which there's no individual right in the Second Amendment, individual rights were never even brought up until Heller. So I don't want to confuse of what the original intent of the Second Amendment was and where we are now. Now, we are now in 2006 and, 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 and past. I get it, and we're expanding on that. Um, and, and, and it's constitutional. I mean, I'd agree with it, but it is constitutional. I understand, but I wanted to clear that up. And, and Chairman, thank you for the time. Again, and thank you for that. Next on the list, I have Chairman Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With the difference of reasonable suspicion and probable cause, could uh, either one of y'all just tell us about what the officers would do in reasonable suspicion versus the probable cause? Chairman Russell, as you know, uh, probable cause is necessary in order to effect an arrest. Reasonable suspicion is enough to investigate further. So uh, officer may have reasonable suspicion, something's going on, but it's not enough evidence to actually either get a warrant or to charge someone unless you get probable cause developed out of the reasonable suspicion. Uh, for instance, some of the cases that have come out lately is maybe a vehicle at midnight at night sitting next to a building, I uh, read one this week about next to a car wash. Uh, individuals out at the car wash, um, officer saw him. The individual squatted down to try to hide himself from the officer and then left the area and took off walking or running, uh, walking fastly or running. And the court was trying to decide, could the officer follow that individual enough to stop him to see what was going on? He certainly had a reasonable suspicion that some criminal activity might be on. And then once he got up and interviewed him, he might be able to develop enough for probable cause. That's the best example I can give. That's perfect. I just want to make sure that everybody knew what the difference was. And thank you. And thank you. And next on the list, I have uh, Leader Lamberth. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, my good friend from Davidson County is always very eloquent. I, I just want to read it. I mean, we're all here fighting about the same thing, but a well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. Now, look, they've been fighting about this for a couple hundred years. All of y'all do a wonderful job of, of doing your jobs and protecting our state. We appreciate that. We Everybody in this room is here because of the First Amendment, by and large, and, and thank you for everybody for peacefully assembling. There are many more of you than there are of us. There are countries that have devolved into non-peaceful protest. Our country's done a pretty good job over the years of, of folks being able to peacefully address their elected officials. I don't think there's any question that there is an individual right to bear arms. And, and Director, you said it best. I mean, there are we in the legislative branch sometimes, I think, like to ignore that there's an executive branch and judicial branch, and I get why we do that. We're the voice of the people. We are the most important branch. There's no doubt about that. But the judicial branch is there for interpretation. And it, at this point in history, there is no question that there is an individual right to bear arms. And my question to really the panel, is there any question in your mind that there is an individual right to bear arms? Whoever wants to take that I, one. I'm, I'm going to... So go ahead, Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Stroker, you're recognized, if you like. Or, I, 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 will I will preface it with this. Let's let's think about it this way. I think that based off the policy that we make, it may be better for a courts to make that determination on whether or not we have the right to mm -hmm. bear arms and not uh, Department of Safety or the, the director of the TBI to make that decision. We make the policy, and I think the courts then interprets that and will then uh, appropriately apply the law and the constitution as they, they see it. And that's, that's why they are where they are. Right. So, and the chairman took the words out of my mouth. We share the same brain a lot of times having come in together a decade ago, uh, with representative Littleton and others, uh, you know, but I just, I don't, there's no question in my mind. Let me just state this without y'all having to go on the record that all of y'all respect folks, individual right to bear arms has been interpreted by the Supreme court. And I think as was originally attended, in, you know, in the Bill of Rights, in the Second Amendment. I mean, it is an extraordinarily important right that we preserve. 
in our laws, I know that whatever is passed here, you all will follow and effectuate that to best of your ability. We get to decide that policy. So we had a lot of back and forth today. It was really good. I just wanted to at least throw that out there. And I wasn't going to say anything to my friend from Davidson County. He made a very impassioned speech about how there was no individual right to bear arms. I understand we've been fighting about that for a long time, but there is. And so with that in mind, Mr. Chairman, those are my comments slash questions. Um, and it probably wasn't a fair question, so I apologize for asking it. But I, I probably should have just saved that for when we back, went back into session. But thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your patience with me. Very good. And that, and I've I've exhausted the list of first timers. I know Representative Parkinson, I know you had another one and and so does Representative Bolzo. So if you just keep it short, we're we're about to run out of time. We're not going to get to all of our um all of our testimony today. So but if you keep it short, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I, I apologize, forgot to ask this. Is there um is there any law enforcement agency in our state that supports this legislation? Not that I'm aware of, Representative. So, okay, so obviously uh, you represent TBI. You guys are against the legislation. Yes, sir. The Department of Safety is against the legislation. Yes, sir. The uh, Association of Police Chiefs are against the legislation. Is yes. that a yes? Is there any single law enforcement agency in our state that is not against this legislation that you know of? No. So every single law enforcement agency in our state opposes this legislation. Correct. So all of the boys in blue and women in blue oppose this legislation. I think she's answered that. Thank, thank you, sir. All right. Thank very you. good. Uh, Representative Bozo, you want to finish this off and then we're going to go back in session. We're going to adjourn next week. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just simply wanted to... Uh, make a point of a historical order. Uh, my friend from Davidson County uh, obviously knows a lot about our rich American history, but the Second Amendment was not debated at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. The Second Amendment was adopted with the rest of the Bill of Rights on December 15 of 1791. And with regard to the Tennessee case that was referred to from 1840, the Second Amendment did not actually become applicable to the state of Tennessee or any other state until 1865 with the adoption of the 14th Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Not, and I appreciate you all coming up here. This is a very important topic, one of the most important topics we're going to discuss and have discussed over the years since I've been here and probably moving forward. So without objection, we're going to go back into session. And without objection, we're going to be adjourned next week.